welcome everyone. I think we'll probably just start first. Can you hear us well? Can you? Are things okay? It's okay. Okay. Great. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're delighted to be here. Uh, Ajahn Kovilo and Tan Lisabo invited us to help um, anchor this Saturday event. And we've had a long friendship with them. And so we, of course, we're extremely grateful to have the opportunity to be here with everyone. And they shared with us just kind of the format of what happens usually on Saturday mornings. So we were going to continue with that format, which was essentially a chant. We we're going to do the Buddha's teachings on loving kindness, uh, and then the reflections on universal well-being, followed by a guided meditation to about 10 o'clock, and then we'll have a talk. Um, and our theme was trying to, how do we bring metta or loving kindness into every action in our lives? We titled it kind of metta in, in action, action. <laughs> and then some Q&A at the end. So um, maybe just to start out, um, I don't know if people know the metta sutta, the Buddha's discourse on loving kindness, but if so, I'd invite everyone to please uh, place your palms together. Um, if you like, I can actually since I do have it very accessible with computers these days, I can share the Metta Sutta on my screen for those who would want to follow. Okay, so we'll start with this is what should be done. This is what should be done. By one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace, let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. Unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise will later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state. Let none do anger or ill will, wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, reading kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding, by not holding to fixed views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. And now the reflections on universal well-being. Mm. 
May I abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may I maintain well-being in myself. May everyone abide in well-being, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will, in freedom from anxiety, and may they maintain well-being in themselves. May all be released from all suffering, and may they not be parted from the good fortune they have attained. When they act upon intention, all beings are owners of their actions and inherit its results. Their future is born from such action, companion to such action, and results will be their home. All actions with intention, be they skillful or harmful, of such acts, they will be the ends. I invite everyone to find a comfortable position. We'll do about 20 minutes of guided meditation. Well, first, I invite you to find a kind of grounded position, maybe sitting cross-legged on the floor, or if you're sitting in a chair, see if you can plant your feet firmly on the floor. And you want to make sure your back is straight. What I find as a useful reflection is Imagine a string pulling up the top of our heads, allowing our spine to align, and letting our whole body dangle in a relaxed way from the string. Having a relaxed and upright body is the foundation of the meditation practice. See if you can just tune into the body, listening to wherever the body is at. As you inhale, see if you can extend the spine, sitting up straight. And as you exhale, just relax the body. Letting go of any tension. Just letting the natural rhythm of the breath help with finding that inner alignment. And sensing into how the exhale just naturally allows us to relax. Breathing in, extend, breathing out, relax.
Just tuning into the body, honoring it, listening to it. accepting whatever state it's in. And on the inhale, extend the spine, sitting upright. Exhale, relax. Now, on the next inhale, see if you can bring your awareness to your face. You often hold a lot of tension in the face. In this practice, we're actually just letting go of all the ways that we habitually cultivated how we need to show up in the world. We don't need to perform in meditation. Just letting the face relax. Bring our awareness to our forehead. Bring our forehead relax. Coming down to the eyes. Relaxing any tension around the eyes. Letting the eyes sink down to their sockets. And gently close your eyes or keep them slightly open to allow a little bit of light through. And then down to the cheeks. Relaxing the jaw. Our mouth is gently closed. Tongue is touching the roof of the mouth, gently curled upward. We're breathing in through our nose. See if you can relax your whole face. Imagine your face heavy. All the muscles on the face just drooping down. On the next inhale, so you can bring your awareness to your shoulders. You can roll your shoulders back if you wish. Along the forward. Just allowing the shoulders to relax. Usually hold a lot of tension in our shoulders from working on the computer. Sometimes we feel tense or anxious and our shoulders come up around our ears. And 
in meditation, we just consciously relax, let go. Imagine your left arm heavy, like there's a weight on your left elbow. Allow your left arm to hang down. As you imagine that, see if your left shoulder muscles begin to extend and unwind and relax. Relaxation takes a little bit of time. We can force it. Just being very gentle with ourselves. If the body feels safe and cared for, it starts to relax. Inhale and sit up straight. Exhale, let the left shoulder relax. And again, just accept whatever state your body is in. If you're feeling your shoulders are tight and can't, can't unwind, that's no problem. Bring a gentle acceptance to however your body is. Then going to the right shoulder. Imagine your right arm heavy. Like there's a weight on your right elbow. Holding your arm down. Allow your right shoulder muscles to lengthen and unwind, relax. Again, this is just very, very gentle. No force. You breathe in, sitting up straight. Find a length in the spine. And as you relax, on the exhale, allowing the right shoulder to relax and open up. And down to the chest. Letting the chest relax. Becoming aware of the sensations that come from breathing. Sensing how the lungs expand and contract. See if you can relax all the muscles around the lungs. No need to hold any tension. Coming home to the body. And then bring your awareness down to your abdominum.
Just see if you can relax all the muscles in your stomach area. Just using enough strength to sit upright. Otherwise, just relaxing the stomach. You can sense how when you breathe in, your diaphragm drops and your stomach comes out. And you exhale, stomach comes in, your diaphragm comes out. It's called belly breathing. Very helpful for calming the mind, calming the heart, calming the body. Again, we can't force the breath to relax or be deep. Well, as we just relax the body, the body naturally knows how to breathe. So imagine like a little baby breathing. Your body's completely relaxed and their whole body breathes. As they inhale, their whole body expands. As they exhale, it contracts. So this meditation is bringing us back to this very primal breath. See if you can just stay with the body and just breathe, relaxing any tension that you find just for about a minute. Next inhale, see if you can extend your spine. And next exhale, just relax the body. And in the five minutes we have left, I invite you all to just tune into this heart of loving kindness, unconditional care. There's many ways to do this. For some of us, we might be more verbal. So we use words like, may I be well? But the key is to not just say the words, but tune into the intention behind the words. So it might be helpful to imagine someone who really cares about us. Perhaps it's our parents, grandparents, friends, teachers, mentors, <laughs> Ajahn Kobilo or Tan Nisabo. <laughs> and just imagine their presence.
their gentle smile as they wish us well. They wish us well, may you be well. And just tuning into that heart of care, we translate that to ourselves. May I be well. May I be physically well. May I be mentally well. May I be emotionally well. May I be spiritually well. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. both in body and mind, finding this inner stillness, this relaxed ease and contentment. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy, to be truly happy. Loving kindness or metta is actually unconditional. And so this care for ourselves is not something we have to deserve. We have to earn. We don't have to look a certain way, be successful in a particular way, get approval from others in another way. This care is unconditional this wish for our happiness. May I be happy. So maybe just for a few minutes, see if you can just tune into that intention of goodwill for ourselves, or care for ourselves. A kindness that has no strings attached. Again, don't force anything. We find that in our hearts, there's other emotions there. And just, we can just envelop it with this heart of acceptance and care. We don't need to change it. Just allow it to be as it is. Hey, so good morning, everyone, again. Morning. <laughs> so, so this exercise is you don't actually want to leave that relaxed, grounded, kind of open-heartedness, uh, awareness at all during this whole time in the morning, actually the whole day or your whole life, highly recommended. <laughs> life will go a lot better if we can just remember to relax and actually just accept whatever is going on in our hearts and just take care of ourselves. Um, but maybe just welcome everyone again. Um, uh, my name is Jing Chuan, 
you'll see it in the Zoom uh, box there. And next me, Ching Wei. Ching Wei. Nice to meet you. And yes, maybe a brief introduction. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area here in Silicon Valley. We're down here in Berkeley right now, Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. And um, maybe very briefly, during high school, I was actually really interested in becoming a monk. And I, uh, <laughs> interesting, say I, I, I first wanted to become a monk before I figured out what religion I was. <laughs> so I thought maybe I'd become a Catholic monk or maybe I'd become a Buddhist monk, but I know I want to be a monk, which I would say is definitely not what most Silicon Valley parents want for their children. <laughs> And so I won't tell that story unless somebody's really curious. Um, but many years later, I ended up at the Sitting Thousand Buddhas, um, which is the kind of the main monastery of Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Um, and actually, there I first met Ajahn Kovilo, who at the time was named Ian, <laughs> Ian Hillard. And he came as a volunteer um, to spend, I think, three months at the Sitting Thousand Buddhas. I was helping at that time as the volunteer coordinator. So I got a chance to, to be with, with um, Ajahn Kovilo for a number of months. And he really enjoyed cleaning up. And there's lots of things to clean up at the Sitting Thousand Buddhas. Uh, I don't know if people know the place, but it's 400 plus acres with something like 40 huge institutional buildings. And so he had one of the office buildings and just cleaned the, the whole time. <laughs> And later he went to Bayagiri and, um, and became a monk there. And I say, I was very happy that over the years, we kept this friendship alive. And that now he's at Dharma Realm Buddhist University as a BA student. And um, I'm currently there as an assistant professor and also the chaplain. And so we get many opportunities to, to learn from one another. Um, for instance, uh, we are currently also starting a forest monastery in Boulder Creek in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we had a chance to talk to Ajahn Kovilo just about monastic training, getting his experience in Abayagiri in Thailand. Hours of talking. Yeah, we spent quite a few hours talking with him about you know, how do we develop a, a modern monastic form, um, one that stays true to our roots, but is responsive to modern conditions. And I think probably you've noticed that we wear slightly different robes <laughs> than um, when we, what you're used to in the Thai forest tradition. It's because we are maybe say part of the Chinese lineage. Um, some might say the, the Mahayana tradition, but we like to call ourselves maybe the Northern tradition from China, Korea, Japan area. And then the Theravada is the Southern tradition from uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, Cambodia. And so we're uh, delighted to have this friendship. Contra, we're very honored to have this friendship with so many noble friends in the Thai forest tradition. I want to introduce yourself just a little bit. Sure. So my name is Jin Wei. And as you tell my accent, I am not a native uh, English <laughs> speaker. I came from the country when it's not easy to find any Buddhist monk. Uh, 96% are Catholics. And I was in this group and still have a lot of respect uh, and grew up kind of a bit confused what I should do. For sure, I would know one thing. I don't want to follow my scripts what society offered to me. And in my teenage years and early 20s, actually, the place where you stay, the Seattle was very close to my heart <laughs> because of music. <laughs> I was a big fan of Nirvana, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, all this grunge movement. Try to find some loving kindness and relief. And actually, the music is good, but somehow I cannot find this Nirvana in my heart when I <laughs> listen to songs and try to do some... <laughs> oh, you don't go there. <laughs> self-medication in different ways and didn't work uh, and some strange ways uh, find connection with people who cultivate dharma cultivate buddhism and it was a immediately deep resonance in my heart you know oh i know i know what i want to do and strangely talking about our 
we often call ourselves Northern tradition, although now we're the South, right? Mm -hmm. In the South compared to the Seattle. That's true, we're South. Uh, but Northern, because that, you know, the, how the, the teaching of the Buddhism travel from the India, the North is the China. We, we, is, we have a Chinese roots in our tradition. And Southern is the, you can say, Southern tradition, right? That countries like uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, and then so forth. My first retreat was actually in Latvia. I came from Poland, right? I mentioned it. my first retreat was in Latvia and led by two Theravada nuns from Amrawati. One is Ajahn Tanya, and forget uh, from New Zealand, and I forget the second nun from Russia at the time. So a deep uh, resonance and uh, respect to the forest tradition. And finally, I was for me clear that this kind of unconscious thought, uh, somehow I feel affinity with these robes. I feel very comfortable wearing them. And being the uh, Buddha hall, feel like at home. This is probably the place when I can find refuge and can stay. So happy to be here, happy to uh, have a, another chance to exchange our southern northern northern southern connections and today we want to talk about the metta in action yeah right? metta in action and so we thought maybe just to start things out was just to share how we discovered loving kindness uh, we wish we discovered it sooner uh, but we actually um so oh yeah 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 okay so okay. we were thinking let's start with the um, invocation I think if you people usually know Theravada, you do Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa. So we'll do a three, we'll do one time in English, one time or one time in Pali, one time in English, and one time in a kind of hybridized Chinese Sanskrit. So okay. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo, homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo, sadanto, suche doye, olahadi, samyao, samputoje. Okay. So today we wanted to talk a little about loving kindness and how it can be manifested in our daily lives. I was about to say how we were introduced ourselves. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, Ajahn Kovilo is going to a college at Dharma Realm Buddhist University in the city of 10,000 Buddhas. And a number of years ago, uh, we actually invited some Abhayagiri monks as consultants for the university. It's kind of funny how you get monks as consultants. And the reason uh, we asked them to be consultants was because uh, we wanted to learn about how Baigiri created wholesome community. Uh, if those who've been to Baigiri know, when you go there, there's just this sense of harmony and peace care. and care that just comes out of the bathrooms. You know, the, the bathrooms are shining. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Real restroom. Yeah, there's a real rest. That's a real <laughs> place of rest. And so, um, and so these two monks came, Ajahn Kachana and Tan Suhajo. Came to visit and i'll have a, a, just a short story but basically i asked them a question one evening about how to support students i said dharma Ram buddhist university is a pretty unique environment um, because you know when the students come generally hold the five precepts no killing so you know no, no violence you know, no kind of violent video games or movies you know not even really aggressive speech or swearing so no no killing uh, not harming any animals or creatures, right? No stealing, uh, no sexual misconduct. And so um, in our campus, because it's actually situated within monastic context, um, the, the men and the women, the male, the different genders um, actually don't hit on each other, which you can imagine pretty extreme for a college campus. And actually many students actually come for the campus because they want to be in an environment where they can explore something deeper than just the kind of surface level of those interactions and no lying 
um, and is so skillful speech and no intoxicants. So no alcohol, marijuana, drug, and so forth. So I say the students come to our campus and they all come with actually a clear intention on wanting to be here, wanting to uphold these guidelines. But what I found was that after maybe a few months, <laughs> it gets pretty tough. It gets pretty tough because as people know, most college campuses, right? Uh, definitely there's gender interaction. It sometimes goes you know, off. You know, alcohol is pretty prevalent. And you know, it's a time when you kind of indulge your senses. I think in the Asian American colleges, there's a there's this kind of sense that you just go to college to enjoy your life, live life to the fullest, explore, experiment. Not only American. Not only American. <laughs> uh, my experience is in America. Uh, this is a slight context. I went to Stanford. I don't know if people know the first thing you do as a Stanford student is something called full moon on the quad. And what happens is all the seniors of the college and all the freshmen of the college go out into the main quad and kiss each other. <laughs> That's the first activity. And now get run. And oh yeah, and then and then people are running around naked, naked. on top of that. So you, the first thing you do when you get to college is you know, everyone's kissing each other, and there's a you know people are running around naked. And I remember I was like, wow, uh, this is quite something. I actually went back in my dorm at that time because actually I want to be a monastic already in my mind. So I thought well, that was probably not the scene for me, but <laughs> but you can see that in colleges, you know, that's um, I think not say maybe that's not common, but this kind of culture of exploration and um, you know, immersing ourselves in the senses is quite, quite prevalent. And so what I found was for students coming to DRBU, they had this intention to, you could say, uh, cultivate their, their hearts, cultivate their mind to master the senses, to develop this inner sense of self-mastery. Um, but it's not easy. And and oftentimes the method that they end up using is repression. They have their desires and they just kind of, I can't do this. So it's just like, I have to hold it in, hold it in, hold it in. And all of a sudden it explode in kind of a burst of anger or some kind of strange desire or, you know, just being really depressed. And so I asked Ajahn Kachana and Tan Suhajo, what would you recommend? I thought they have some kind of community practice or, um, teaching on you know friendship but it's interesting both of them immediately said meta i said meta like loving kindness I said, yeah loving kindness so, um huh because to me at the time i thought of loving kindness as you know the phrase is may i be well may i be peaceful and at ease may i be happy right and i, said, I actually do that sometimes in my meditation but you know it's kind of like okay may i be well may I be peaceful you know it's kind of nice and and they, they both looked at me with this kind of shock, like, like you don't know? <laughs> you don't know about yeah. loving kindness? You're missing it's, something important yeah, here. It's like the best part of monastic <laughs> life. I said, like, really? <laughs> well, what, can you explain? They said, well, you know. Um, so for instance, uh, Ajahn Kachana said, let me explain to you. So I was just going to one of the DRBU classes, and it was this wonderful conversation around kind of Buddhist hermeneutics or different ways of Buddhism kind of looks at um, principles and different ways of interpretation. And it was a very rich conversation. And it was very exciting. And afterwards, I was so, so happy. I said, at that point, there's a feeling like I want to go out and talk to people. But rather than doing that with that energy, I just actually just said, spend some time and just feel that sense of well-being and happiness in my body. And he said something that really stuck with me. He says, you know how we often hold trauma in our bodies? And we have a very painful experience and something tenses up and tightens up inside. He says, we can also traumatize ourselves with metta. I said, huh. <laughs> that we, our body can actually remember feelings of well-being and happiness. And so I just wanted to remember that experience in my body. I said, huh. That's really interesting. I never thought of loving kindness that way before. One was just bringing it into the body body and number two you know using it right after class you know after a class you might have this moment of happiness and excitement but rather than just going out and socializing right using the energy and interacting with other people 
So actually, I'm just going to bring that inward and just find some kind of ground there. And then Tansu Hajo was <laughs> said, ah, actually, actually, you know, what I do is I use actually a lot of the practices you have in your tradition. I use like the mudras and the mantras, the great compassion mantra, even there's Guanin Bodhisattva. I don't know if you know Guanin Bodhisattva is the Bodhisattva of great compassion. He said, yeah, just visualizations and these kind of things. You know, I don't just use phrases, use whatever works. Our style is whatever works. So, spiritual playing ground. Yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, we have all these practices in our tradition. Yeah. I've never thought about that before, the loving kindness. And so that really kind of opened the door to me saying, actually, um, we can really cultivate this loving kindness in every moment. And I don't know if you want to maybe show. We actually came back and I immediately shared with Jing Weishu. And, I, and so we spend this kind of, most of our conversations now have some loving kindness at some point <laughs> popping up. Oh, for sure. And I say, wow, Jing Charge is so enthusiastic about this meta, 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 you know, loving kindness. I was so really traumatized by this kindness. <laughs> and so we have a kind of a self-exploration how actually I can use this method. Because into some point of my practice, some of you maybe could relate to this state at some point in our uh, spiritual journey. The kind of my colors a little bit faded. The fire was not so strong anymore. And I have, I can say no joy, but it was a little joy. <laughs> you know, I have to just follow the routine, kind of very mechanistic, my practice, you know. Do what I have to do, like homework, right? I have to do my homework, you know? And well, I don't see the spark of joy in my heart to do the homework all the time. And this is one part. And the second, I, as I mentioned, I came uh, from Europe and uh, from the place when many of my friends, including myself, we suffer from the call guilt, right? not really kind of accepting fully ourselves, you know, having in behind this mind, this tyrant is never happy. You always can do better your practice or you fail. What, where is the progress? It's no progress, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's like, oh, please, please be, be kind to me. You know, no, you have to be harder, you have to be harder. You know, we, some point we call ourselves Dharma Marines, you know, very, you know, try hard. And so, well, I have to change the tactic, you know, here because it's no joy, <laughs> no more, you know, happiness. And I was traumatized by not kindness, but by self uh, harshness or self hatred, I can say. And here in the monastery, uh, I think since the beginning, and uh, it was established in Berkeley Buddhist Monastery in 1995. As we said, we have a long uh, friendship with the uh, Theravada, right? The, especially Thai Forest Sangha. And every month, first Tuesday, we, we have a monks who came here and offer the tea and dhamma. Same similar format as we have here today in the morning. Yeah. For the years Ajahn Amaro came before he came to, uh, to Amarawati in England, and later Ajahn Pass and Ajahn Nanik, and different monks from this uh, Tuesdays, we met almost whole community in Ambayagiri yeah. and actually make uh, some connections and friendship. And I remember one time Ajahn Karunadamo came and I was a very you know, eager student of Meta. I remember after the lecture, ask him, Venable, can you tell me something about this magic of Meta? You know, I try hard. <laughs> I don't see this kind of kindness in myself. I, I cultivate something else. And what he says, you like two things is, oh, first, be creative. Be really creative. And it's very important. It's not the phrases what you're saying, but the feelings behind the, the phrases of loving kindness, this loving care, loving acceptance. And he says, my method, I use the one word mantra, is I reciting word gentle. gentle anything arise any tension in the body in the heart meeting with this kind of gentleness welcoming accepting i says huh hmm i see this is like like art right we are become inner artists of our states and kind of painting our inner states 
with skillfulness and finding what really works, like uh, Venerable yeah. Suhadja says. Yes, Adva. Uh, so I don't know if people know Ajahn Kunandamo, but he was the first Anagarika Abayagiri. So in the very beginning, it was Ajahn Amaro, Ajahn Pasano, and Ajahn Kunandamo. And he's a very gentle presence. Oh, super gentle. He actually, I think, was a nurse before. I think from Seattle, actually. Yeah, maybe. Actually. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So. so, okay, I have to find some mind uh, key to my heart somehow. And, you know, I, for some uh, time, recite the phrase safe, safety, because I feel a little bit fear and, and uncertainty and anxiety. And to kind of establish the safe, place you can say the sacred space in my heart and even accept this you know this judge what is always unhappy and the key for me to open my heart honestly was a visage visualization what it was almost every meditation i in my uh, meditation i met my grandma i visualize as a 10 years old boy going to grandma like very excited wow i see my grandma uh, you know coming to her house feeling the smell uh, you know having this kind of loving kindness everywhere every corner of the house is my grandma presence and she's seeing me it's like at the time it was marek marek give me a hug you know it's so wonderful to see you and look at on me with this kind of gentle uh, loving uh, eyes and my reflection was first of like feel it this feel it this feelings of kindness and acceptance be with this and as a reflection can to myself look at on myself in the same way how my grandma look at me mm. with my grandma eyes should I use this judge eye <laughs> you know you know, everything you do is wrong, so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's happy that you are here. <laughs> I'm so glad. And it's really turned my uh, connection to my practice and having this kind of loving acceptance, something what is real in my life and cultivate this acceptance, relaxation, that give a new life. So the colors become more bright, <laughs> you know, the fire rise and, and willingness and enthusiasm. I really want to do this, not just in meditation. Can I cultivate it every moment during my day? How I can bring this loving kindness into action? Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to share, and I realize in terms of time, we're, um, we're a little bit over. So maybe I can share just a few minutes of this because I, we, one thing that really inspired us when it talks about loving kindness embodied is a program called Guiding Rage into Power. And if people have the time, I definitely recommend going and finding this yourself. Um, so it's called GRIP, Guiding Rage into Power. And it's a program in San Quentin. I don't know if people know, but here in California, there's a maximum security prison called San Quentin. And the founder of his name, Jack Verdun, um, who you say has Buddha, definitely has Buddhist roots, uh, but he's translated the Dharma into a way that completely makes sense for these, um, you know, people having lifetime sentences in jail who had very violent backgrounds. Perhaps their parents murdered each other or they murdered somebody themselves. And they actually are completely transformed. Mm. And I think we were just wanted to show the video just to see how loving kindness manifests in the space. Just a little bit of background, and you can look into yourself. Uh, here are the numbers, which is stunning. They have 1,233 graduates from their program. Now these Many of them are lifetime sentences, so they get they have to go before the board to get released, to, get, to evaluate them before they can get released. And 421 actually got released. Okay, amazing number. Which is an amazing number to begin with. And then in terms of number reoffended, two for nonviolent crimes. You know, maybe some addiction and they, they got back into jail. Just imagine that out of 421 people, two people 
reoffended after doing this program. 99.8% success rate. And so and when you watch this video, I think it's just stunning because I don't know how it just opens my heart every time I watch it. Yeah, it's I watched it many, many times. Yeah, because it's almost like we think, oh, I have it tough. Well, yeah. Imagine being in a, a maximum security prison, you know, having grown up in very traumatic experiences and then transforming yourself. And this is this is what we're seeing. So we'll just watch a little bit at the beginning, just given time. So they're sitting in a circle. just to start so he says 662 so at the very beginning of this program jack you know has a group of about 32 men sitting in a circle and he asks them a question he says how many years have you served in prison and so in the 30 men you may be some say 15 some say 20 some may say 40 right so he adds it up and sometimes it can be over a thousand years so in this case, 662. And after that question, he asks a second question. He says, how long did it take from the moment you felt imminent danger, where you felt activated when things started to speed up, you got agitated, and then you committed the crime mm -hmm. that got you here? And these men say, 15 seconds. One minute. One minute, yeah. 10 minutes, maybe. So they, they total that number up as well. And it comes up maybe like 35 minutes. So it says 35 minutes of time for almost a millennia of life. He asks, is it worth it? <laughs> and then he says, so in this program, we're teaching you never to miss a moment like that again. So that's what he means by power. The power not to react. The power not to just give in to anger and rage. So... Like we're getting BBQ, all colors in the twine, like a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. We gotta stop the violence. Grip is the acronym, cause we've been guiding. Rage and a power, power and a peace, so that we can leave prison before we get released. Yeah. Cause hurt people hurt people. But heal people heal people, yeah. I had a dream I could find my way to freedom and free people, free people, yeah. Recently, like I explained, shared with some of y'all, my brother was murdered November 17th this year, last year, I mean, and uh, today is his birthday. And normally if somebody get hit on our side, we go retaliate and go do something on their side. Now this is the time when you just sitting here and I'm doing it in a healthy way. I'm sitting in here and I'm going through the anger, I'm going through the hurt. I'm going through the good times, laughing about the good memories that I had of him, and I'm not just stuck in that one gear. And if it wasn't for this group, I don't think that I would be able to sit back and respond healthily like this. And that's that emotional intelligence. That's being able to track exactly what I'm feeling. That's learning how to sit in that fire and not just go react to something every time you get hurt. To me, it was with the, that's... Like I say, it's big. So for them, they call meditation sitting in the fire. Because I think if anybody who's sat long enough, you can feel the fire inside. <laughs> Especially if we come, some painful memories arise and we, we feel the kind of tension, right? Being able to just sit through that, relax into it, accept it, and just let it burn through. So they say just burn through and leave ashes. And so this is where loving kindness comes in. Right there, you can hear it. The sense of acceptance, the sense of kind of, remembering the good times remembering the happiness not just stuck in the right. trauma right there's the common phrase stop stop means stop to observe and process mm -hmm. so instead of react habitually usually from the some trauma unprocessed traumas the triggers what we kind of automatically follow to kind of observation and 
respond instead of react, instead of, you know, fight, run, and hide process, have this open space to see that I have a choice every time I have a choice. I've been spinning on the wheel of cause and effect, searching for original pain. I'm feeling shame and regrets when it surfaces, wonder what the purpose is. I would never know how many people have been hurt from this. Okay, so right here he said original pain. Uh, he makes another interesting distinction that's, that's completely in alignment with uh, the Pali scriptures. So he calls what we experience in our lives, you know, the trauma that we receive, original pain. But he says that we add a lot, a lot on top of that, the guilt, the self-hatred, shame, the shame. And that's secondary pain. So, so he says that's avoidable. If we can actually train ourselves, like what Jean Weisher said, the, the loving kindness, we learn how to cultivate this heart of loving kindness. We still feel the initial pain, right, experience, but we don't have to add more pain onto that. So the first dart can hit us, but the second is optional. Yeah, the second is optional. Something I committed out of anger, could have, should have, would have, thinking how I could have handled the situation better. I see plenty, plenty in the rearview mirror, hindsight 2020. I feel that, uh, the change that I'm making is genuine. I mean, I wanted to change way back then, but I really didn't know how. I was still lying about my commitment offense. I was saying that I was confronted in a liquor store by a gang member. I went outside the liquor store. He followed me outside the liquor store and uh, pulled a weapon out. You know, a struggle ensued for possession of the weapon and I shot him. You know, that was, that was my, my legal defense. You know, so I've been living that lie for, for years now. And, uh, you know, but when I got here and I started participating in some of the groups, you know, I, I started to realize what accountability was about. And then I would be seeing guys, you know, holding their truth, people like Robin, you know, and, and, and Kyrie and Troy. I would see these guys, and so they inspired me. They let me know, okay, if these guys can change, then I know that I can change. You know, in terms of, in terms of being open and honest, you know, about the things I've done. Bless you, bro. Hey, stay strong, bro. You got that. That's what he does. Change is that yeah. like rejoicing. <laughs> 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 I love that. That's right. Stand in truth, man. Stand in truth. All right. We're coming in here because we get to remind each other, welcome each other back in who we really are. Because when we committed a crime, we forgot. We forgot who we really are. And so you cannot forget that again. So that's actually really key um, is when he actually starts the program, he actually has people, he asks people, how many people are here to improve yourselves, to get better? And usually most of these people raise their hand, you know, because, you know, they maybe killed somebody or did something. And he says, everyone get out of the room, come back in with another motivation. Because if you come here, with this mindset that you need to be better, you need to improve yourself, then the whole time you're in this program, you're going to be thinking, I'm not good enough and I need to get better. You have this inner negative narrative. Rather, what you want to come in is, just what you just see when he just said, when we committed a crime or we did something harmful, we just forgot who we really are. We forgot our heart of kindness, our heart of goodness, our heart of not wanting to suffer and causing other people to suffer. We just forgot. And so in this program, in, tr in our cultivation, in our training, it's going back home, going back home. It's not to try to fix ourselves because we're broken. So that narrative en is endless. You know, it's endless. It's so like we need to earn something at some any point so we can be successful. No, no, no. This is actually going home to some place that's already inherent within all of us. Right. Not kind of from the sense of lacking or yeah. missing something. The defining that actually be complete, and the word words like bad, worst, better, or the best is not actually have any reality there. Yeah. Right? Why I have to be the best? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. Who I am, and the loving kindness give us the sense of it when we tune into this kind of caring yeah. place. We like to joke with loving kindness. You always win. And, and you never, loving kindness never fails. Never fails, yeah. Because you never play a losing game, right? We, we, we get pulled into a game of win and lose. Yeah. We're already out of the game of loving kindness. Loving Praise kindness or blame, yeah. Wants everyone to be happy, peaceful, 
well, so forth. On December 7th, 1994, uh, I murdered a woman named Christy Anderson. She uh, is the mother of my now 20-year-old daughter. On Thanksgiving, I saw my daughter for the first time uh, in 19 years since I've been in prison. For me, one of my biggest problems was my anger and violent and aggressive outbursts. My mother sent me to live with my father when I was nine, and my father used to beat me like I was a grown man. And I think without a program like GRIP, I wouldn't have been able to receive a visit and be open to everything that uh, my daughter Katie had to say to me on Thanksgiving. Uh, the fact that someone who I felt I harmed the most in this world could tell me that they forgive me for what I did. If one of you is working, you're all doing your work because we all have skeletons in the closet. We all have hurt people. And it's coming clean with that. That is a big part of reclaiming who we truly are. So in closing, I want to honor the earth, the air, the water, the fire. And I want to say a prayer for our ancestors and all of you here today and the work that you're doing and how it will resonate, not only here in San Quentin in this community, but throughout the world. Gratitude for sure is the So, uh, Troy, could you uh, enlighten us as to what's different here? I'm still breathing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, last week, I went to the board and I uh, was found suitable uh, for release. Wow. <laughs> no small matter. Yeah. No small matter. Okay, so sorry, I realized we didn't a little bit not have too much time at the end, but you should, yeah. you should watch the whole thing. So I think that's it. <laughs> but um, actually, that program was introduced to us by another DRBU student who was uh, a volunteer, volunteer in this program. So he would go to San Quentin and, um, you know, be a facilitator and they go for whole day workshops and be, be a year long program. And so he shared with a lot of the materials. And honestly, when I saw, I was like, wow, you know, at least for men, I mean, probably everybody, but at least for men, this would be a wonderful program for learning how to be a man. And how do you transform your anger and aggression and you know needing to, to do stuff into being able to be of service, being caring, to being um, you know, responsible? I mean, it's, it's actually a really amazing uh, program on a multitude of levels and how thoughtful it is. And it's interesting that us... We can also uh, go to the website and find some talks and oh, very yeah. inspiring. Uh, many of those men who are released and return to their communities serve as a peacemakers so who bring peace, peace, uh, bring connection and dialogue. And in many ways, uh, I think it's coming from this heart of loving kindness. For sure. And not to judge ourselves who we are as a person but notify that unskillful behaviors that lead us to suffering. And they actually do us as a part of the, you can say the cleaning the closet, like Jack says, the letter of unfinished businesses, very honestly, vulnerably share, you know, what's happened truly, uh, you know, and uh, often even uh, they have a chance to meet those who they hurt. Yeah, And the very kind of, the, you, you heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. You know, often we are repeating the pattern. We become a victim and, you know, and, and become an offender. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the circle, karmic circle can say, and say the heal people, heal people. Yeah. 
and we can heal ourselves. And for us, I see the Dharma is this a medicine. Mm -hmm. We bring the peace anywhere we go and the start with our heart, with the, the heart of kind of forgiveness and deep change. This is quite very inspiring. So I maybe just, I don't know if we're allowed to go a little bit over time or not, um, but we could, we're happy to take any questions. Yeah, please. I, I don't know what the format exactly is in terms of being a little bit over time. Are there any questions from anyone? I'm not sure who's the... There's not a particular question immediately. I can share actually another thing from their program that um, I think was quite inspiring. Um, something I think worth for us also to think about for ourselves. They actually start with a pledge. So you'll see on their website, they'll say here, they take a peace pledge. And if you look through it, um, I won't read through everything of it, but it's basically not being violent, you know, praying for those they've hurt. I found this would be a very, very good one. It says, learn how to foster sincere connections, express my affections, develop intimacy, and not create harm with sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. so I was like, wow, that's a beautiful way to talk about no sexual misconduct, the third precept. Right? Strive to establish equality and nurture healthy and authentic relations with other beings. And also challenge violence firmly, but, but kindly. kindly. Mm -hmm. So it's not about being a, a pushover. It's been being quite strong, but the strength comes from a different place. I like the final line. I commit myself to a lifetime of nonviolence and peacekeeping as if life depends on it, because I understand it does. <laughs> <laughs> and so what they do when they join this program, they have to sign this as a pledge and they actually keep each other accountable as a group. 52 weeks. Yeah, for 52 month. weeks for one year. And when they graduate, and you can see some of their ceremonies when they graduate, they have the opportunity, basically they then sign this pledge for a lifetime. So they commit to this for a lifetime. So it's like, wow. Yeah, we are quite inspired by this pledge. We create the pledge for the monastery when people come in and stay some time in the monastery. Also we have a, a similar, maybe not uh, exactly the same, but try to translate that important guidelines and principles that we want to see in the community. And the, the heart of it is the four hearts, right? Loving kindness, kindness. compassion equanimity and uh, sympathetic joy mm -hmm. and then of course the five precepts and so forth yeah i see only one question which is will this recording be available online i believe so i believe so okay well yeah. if there's not a specific Hello. question oh, oh yeah, yeah please please uh hi my name is nelly so um i'm a mother of five years old and um how do I teach or coaching my little girls who just um, start to learn her emotional and doesn't um, really aware to it yet? And I would love her to learn um, love and kindness to that, like in an easy way for finding yourself. Wonderful. Um, I can maybe share. Of course, since I'm not a parent, I would, I would defer actually to the parents here who are actually yeah. real parents. Yeah. But I did. we do have parents come to the monastery, so I did read some books on parenting. <laughs> and there was one book that I found was very good called, uh, I think it's Talk, Listen So Your Kids Will Talk, Talk Like Your Kids Will Listen. And when I read through it, I thought it was actually a very good, concrete way of practicing loving kindness in a parent-child relationship. And the first thing that they say you do as you accept your children's feelings. You don't reject your children's feelings. And he gave a very concrete example. It says, sometimes, you know, your child comes home and says, I hate grandma. And you say, no, you don't. You love grandma. <laughs> or they say, it's, it's you know, you, you're they're wearing too much clothes. They're wearing a lot of clothes, you know, and it's and it's hot outside. You say, it's, it's so hot. Why are you wearing a lot of clothing? Take off your jacket. And he says, what happens for a child when a parent basically doesn't, allow them to have their feelings is that they develop two, two responses. One response is they don't trust their parents because their parents aren't able, aren't reflecting what's actually going inside or they no longer trust their own feelings and are just pleasing their parents. And so the first thing that they teach 
which is very interesting, I think it's a very loving kindness, is you actually accept your children's feelings. So for instance, I hate grandma it says, oh, it sounds like you're really angry. What happened? So you see how loving kindness responds back with that kind of sense of care and acceptance? The same thing for ourselves. I mean, we some had grew up with a very tyrannical inner parent <laughs> who doesn't allow us to feel anything. We feel anger and immediately we, we judge ourselves as a bad person, you know, or uh, we feel depressed and we, we, we start to, you know, you get even more depressed because we start yelling at ourselves internally for being depressed and being like lazy or incompetent and da 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 da. It just goes on and on and on rather than just saying, hey, you know, I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling sad. Right. Okay. It's okay. Doesn't, doesn't mean that I have to go and express the sadness or the anger in a way that will harm myself or other people, but I need to hold that feeling with real gentle care. And from there, something can maybe arise that's a skillful action. So. Treasure, you want to share, came to my mind, the story of tool, Toolbox? And uh, <laughs> in the university, we have a... Um, uh, yeah, there's a grandma, grandma. Who, is a, who is also our, our, cons our counselor, our school counselor at Dharmaram Buddhist University. I have a lot of my stories from DRB today. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so she invited, and also introduced me something called Toolbox, which if you really want to look into too, is also um, Amazing. a wonderful program yeah. for teaching young children from probably about five to 12 emotional intelligence. You can take courses on Zoom yeah, too. Took, we actually yeah. joined them on the courses. Yeah. <laughs> so uh this is exploring uh so they teach different tools on how to um you know be aware of what's going on inside you have kind of emotional intelligence yeah very often what is also uh taught in the san quentin for the, yeah. the from the prisoners and very important component of transformation so this is understand the feelings and emotions yeah so this is taught you know with the age range of you know younger kids in mind and so she says she went home one day and her, you know, grandson is always really excited to see her because maybe they go out for ice cream or they go play, you know. And so she gets home and, and her grandson's like, oh, grandma. And then and all of a sudden she stops. And then he runs into his room and disappears. And she's just waiting outside for like a few minutes. And then she goes, huh, what's going on? So she goes into his room and he looks at him. He's lying on his bed, just breathing. <laughs> She goes, are you okay? What's going on? And she says, Grandma, I'm too excited. I need to calm down. <laughs> I'm using my breathing tool. My breathing tool. And then after a little bit, he gets up and says, ah, I'm better now, Grandma. We can go. He's like, what? What's that? <laughs> and so she, she went and looked into it. And it's something called Toolbox. And essentially, they teach you know, children different tools, like the breathing tool, a patience tool, trash tool, a trash uh, garbage can tool, garbage can, which tool. is all that stuff that you don't need to keep it in yourself. Yeah. You can just throw away your let trash. go little things. Yeah, <laughs> let go little things. I really like the patience tool. It's called I have the strength to wait. Yeah, I have the strength. I have the strength to wait. Patience is I have the strength to wait. And so, anyways, um, uh, as a mother, um, I think for sure one thing is taking care of ourselves, and then for our children, the first step I think really allowing them to have their feelings and then being gentle. And I can say also cultivate loving kindness for yourself yeah. because definitely the children can really sense of our state of well being and can really offer kids for coworkers, for family members. When we are happy, this happiness really pervades. So, but I would also get advice from another real parent yeah <laughs> that you admire that you think oh they, they're doing a pretty good job because they will probably have very concrete advice <laughs> yeah we are enthusiasts we are not experts yeah, so. that's for sure <laughs> okay i don't know if um there's much more but i think probably do we need a finish what's the uh we can go a little bit longer if we would like or we can also finish up okay if um, maybe that's it. Can we finish with a brief chant? This is another expression of loving kindness that is. Uh, oh, somebody has oh. Hong, Huang Le, please. please. Uh, hi. hi. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I have a. I don't have kids, but uh, I have parents. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, my mom, I think uh, in recent years, she had developed a more materialistic worldview. 
actually care a lot more about material things. And I think that is yeah. unhealthy for her and um, her, everybody's around her. So, but I have, I've given up trying to change her, but mm -hmm. now, but now I actually thinking that I can do something. Um, I can do something, not like trying to change her, but like, um, like there's a way like through Dhamma, like somehow. Yeah. yeah. I, oh, I, for I sure. For sure. That. I wonder how, yeah. Cause I've tried to change her <laughs> and that didn't go very well. Yeah. Um, that definitely did not go well. <laughs> So. Yeah, we have a recently a conversation because as you can imagine, many people who decide to go the monastic path have a very uh, interesting conversation with their parents. <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> Monk? You know, and there are all the stories, a lot of uh, tears in behind. And, and you know, this one, uh, but I also coming from my experience is truly the ability to listen mm -hmm. even before try to even respond truly listen you know uh, in my case with my father have uh, some tension as you similarly the the big shift happened when uh, i stopped wanted to fix him <laughs> Oh, you have to be more dharmic, you know. Why you do this and that? This is not according with the Dhamma and, and so forth. It doesn't work, you know. But can I listen and meet you truly who you are? Mm -hmm. Can we make a connection? You know, when we have a, we deeply listen and value the person, who this person is, we s slowly open up something what is even beyond intellectual thinking you should do this or that and loving, loving kindness very helps into it yeah essential 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 you know so my first thing when i i don't often coming to visit home but sometimes being a monk and see this all the dynamics in the <laughs> my parents home is kind of interesting to watch first thing relax and I kind of sitting relaxed you know and in our tradition, we have a very strong connection to Guanin Bodhisattva, that is a Bodhisattva of great compassion, but she embodied a lot of qualities of loving kindness and compassion and equanimity and so forth. So I kind of stay there and, you know, and don't try to do anything, honestly. Just try to make connection through listening. And I listen, recently someone says very well, be very creative. And that the best way to be creative, do the love, you know, the act of kindness. You know, instead of doing the uh, random act of violence, we do random act of kindness. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this really can change the atmosphere. And the same time allows to my father be who he is. You know, he has his goals, his values. And... I can, uh, you know, accept who he is, you know, and have a kind of uh, space to, to be with him in kind of true way. Yeah, I think just to add on to what Ching Wei said. So listening, I think, is really key. Um, and really seeing them for who they are is really key. Um, I think parents for children as well, that's, there's a double relationship there. It's oftentimes parents, we might see our children and want them to be a certain way. Um, and so we don't actually see the child for how they are, but we see what we want to see. The same often goes for parents. We don't see our parents for who they are as human beings with their own struggles and values and aspirations, but kind of an idealized image of how we think they're supposed to be. And so I think in the Dhamma practice, what we find is we begin to develop the skills to to open up our hearts and open up our minds mm -hmm. to realize actually I can't control my parents. You know, I can't control this world, but what I can do is let go and deeply listen and deeply accord with this heart of kindness. And, and parents and people feel that it's mm -hmm. precognitive. When somebody shows up in your space and let's say your mom says something like, why don't you get a job? 
you know, I talk to them, we become a monk. And you're a failure, you know, I'm embarrassed. You know, it's like, okay, I hear that. So mom, what I hear is you're really upset because you hope that I, I can be responsible for myself. We can empathize. We can empathize. Those you, you really want me to be responsible for yourself. I, I, yeah, I hear that, mom. And I really care about the family. I really care about you. Oh, are you leaving the family? I really, care. I really, I do care about the family. You know, I really I value, you know, both you and dad. You know, just, just that, so that, 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 that heart of connection, you just can take every, all the kind of principles and stuff aside, the teaching stuff aside. They're not, they say the Dharma is spoken upon request. It's at the point when they're actually interested that you maybe want to share something. But other than that, just showing up with care, with service, with listening, mm -hmm. they begin to say, wow, I, I really like my, my son going to learn the Dharma because <laughs> he's yeah. come out very more peaceful. I, the, the, this is the real story. Zilong, remember? The Zilong. Zilong, I have a friend from China. How he changed his parents? Very scientific i can say materialistic people who are very denying any religion i can say or spirituality he uh was very dedicated to the goenka retreats yeah and what he'd start doing uh uh washing dishes after the dinners and any meal with huge enthusiasm and kind of willing, willing to help it never happened before and they was very shocked. What's happened to my son? <laughs> and the long story, the short, finally, they start coming to the Goenka retreats, both of them, and cultivate the Dhamma. Because it's some connection happened. He, you know, unconditionally want to give yeah. without yeah. Uh, finding any reward. Yeah. I just want to support you with, with uh, happiness. This yeah. is wonderful. You know, it's, oh, yeah, that, that makes a huge difference. <laughs> meta in action, you know, small act of kindness, very calm and change relationship when people see that we don't seeking nothing in reward. Yeah, we're just doing it because we care about everybody. Yeah. We want everyone to be happy. Okay, so sorry, we're going a bit, quite a bit over time. Um, I see someone clear mouth that says they will read a blessing braid for offering merit at the end of the meeting. Um, will somebody be doing that? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, I can do the uh, blessing braid. Uh, so for Cora, family dog who passed, for Aileen, her 93-year-old uh, friend passed away last night, mm -hmm. for Cassidy, dear friend who passed from cancer last night for mandy struggling with uh, nighttime seizures for matika longtime supporter of the saga and a, a by gary who just passed uh for Thad thaddeus a son who's living a stage four cancer uh for betty a mother who will be undergoing hip replacement surgery for Susan, a sister-in-law who died earlier this month, for Joseph's relatives and neighbors, just tested positive for COVID, uh, for all beings everywhere without exception, uh, requesting recitation of the Ratana Sutta for the benefit of all beings everywhere without exception. Uh, I don't have that Sutta in front of me, but it's, it sounds interesting. Um, usually, we do a chant at this point. Um, we offer one. We have one we can offer. I'm sorry? We can offer one if that'd be all right. We have a oh, okay. uh, dedication. Uh, sure. Chant. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. And of course, we want to uh, include all of yeah. us in this call in, in the St. Mark Cathedral. Yeah. So please join in. Um, this is actually very easy to follow along. And it's definitely an expression of loving kindness written by uh, um, a Buddhist yeah. musician that we know in our community named Eve Decker. So trying to use the, take the meta phrases and make it something that connects directly to our hearts in kind of regular English. And so we'll do this three times and people are welcome to uh, join in when you have the, the lyrics. Maybe this is just a brief explanation. Be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. The inner harm is sometimes the self-judgments, uh, the kind of 
self-criticism, how to harm like COVID. Truly, or, yeah, truly happy and deeply peaceful. We find an abiding place of well-being, not just the ups and downs of life. Healthy and strong, physically at ease. Our bodies relaxed. And I really like the last line, uh, which is may we take care of ourselves and live with well-being. And this is actually a teaching on equanimity that people saw in the reflections on universal well-being. Uh, the last reflection was, we are all owners of our karma. That's actually a teaching on equanimity. And so this is saying, may all of us have the inner resources to take care of ourselves. So this prevents codependency. I think for parents, this is a wonderful uh, reflection for children as well. So as parents, we're trying to help our children learn how to take care of themselves. Similarly for parents, children, for their parents. I'm hoping that I support their choices for well-being. So that's the last one. Okay, so we can maybe chant it three times together with all those people that were just read in our hearts as well. This we isn't just the we here in this community, but this we can be infinite, connecting to all the beings that uh, we touch in our hearts, which is, which is everything. And boundless and infinite. Yeah. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. May we be truly happy and deeply peaceful. May we be healthy and strong and physically at ease. May we take care of ourselves and live with well-being. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm may we be truly happy and deeply peaceful may we be healthy and strong and physically at ease may we take care of ourselves and live with well-being may we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm, may we be truly happy and deeply peaceful. May we be healthy and strong and physically at ease. May we take care of ourselves and live with well-being. Okay, may you all be well. Have a wonderful rest of the day and the week and and life and life. <laughs> and we always stay relaxed and with this heart of kindness.